Welcome to the India Business Leader of the Year Award 2019 as a part of Forrester's India Meeting. It's a pleasure to be here amongst all of you. And very warm welcome to each one of you in the room for this particular session. The Indian Business Leader of the Year Award recognizes the achievement and excellence of outstanding entrepreneurship who have been building and leading successful global firms. The recipients of the awards are visionaries driving outstanding business of present times and have leveraged their knowledge, foresight, and experience to drive the growth of their business ventures and social causes with fervent passion and purpose. As we present these awards today, you will agree that the leaders being felicitated are two beacons who, through their vision and their work, are helping shape our country's future. My colleague, Nitin Atholi, joins me in the felicitation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege, it's a pride, it's a pleasure to start the ceremony by felicitating someone who's a Padam Bhushan. She's an icon in the field of PSR, as chairperson of the Aditya Virla Center for Community Initiatives and Rural Development. She leads her team with a single-minded focus on whatever it takes to lift the poor out of your poverty. Compassion and service to humanity is the only currency that counts in our character. Her vision extends beyond the Aditya Birla group to the nation as she endeavors to raise the Human Development Index of India to the work in the villages serving the underserved. The impact of her work in qualitative and quantitative terms is awesome. In projects in healthcare, education, fostering the girl child, women empowerment, and sustainable livelihood, she has helped make a difference to 7.5 million people in 5,000 villages in which group works. Under her stewardship, the concept of modern villages has been a great innovation in more than Hundred model villages where she is engaged in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Karnataka, Gujarat, and elsewhere, the difference is palpable. From abject poverty to meeting the necessities of life, from dependency to freedom, from backwardness to progress, tens of thousands of villagers live with a newfound dignity, celebrating a new life. To make CSR a way of life, she has set up Piki Aditya Virla CSR Center for Excellence in Delhi. In recognition of, of, of our exemplary contribution to CSR domain, several accolades, national and global, have been conferred upon her. An evolved, reflective, spiritual person, an optimist with a can do attitude, forever willing to learn afresh, she is a great role model not only in the field of CSR, for, both, for women personally. As Karmi Yogini, she follows the philosophy of hope. In appreciation of our game-changing community work, we are pleased to present the Horace's KPMG India Business Leader of the Year Award for Corporate Citizenship to Mrs. Rajshri Birla, Chairperson Aditya Birla Center for Community Initiative and Rural Development. recognizes the spirit of entrepreneurship and is perhaps no better example than Vijay Shikhar Sharma. His career as an entrepreneur started while he was in college. 
and his journey since then has been inspiring. He is the chairman and CEO of 197 Communications and its consumer brand, PTM. He has played a critical role in developing the mobile, payment, and commerce ecosystem in India. His goal is to build India's largest payments, commerce, and financial services conglomerate and the country's first 100 billion payments company. He's been a visionary who leveraged the smartphone revolution of India and is now focused on creating a digital cashless economy. A strong believer in emerging technologies, he founded KTM in August 2010 and continues to oversee the company's key strategic efforts, including engineering, design, and marketing. He's also launched the PTM Bank, Payments Bank, and introduced a new business model to Indian banking. As someone who is acutely aware of the value of money, he takes active interest in social and philanthropic activities. He's involved with ventures operating in green cities, clean food, reducing pollution, and forest restoration. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to present the Horasis KPM, the Indian Business Leader of the Year Award for Entrepreneurship to Mr. Vijay Shekhar Sharma, Founder and CEO of PTM. Next award recognizes excellence in business transformation. Being truly competitive in today's global world requires foresight, ingenuity, and an innovative brand of leadership. Anil Chaudhary, our next awardee, exemplifies all of these. He's managing director and country president of Hydro Electric India, a veteran of energy and automat automation center. Sector. He has more than three decades of experience in energy and infrastructure segments, a strong votary of the usage of technology and smart grid initiatives. He brings with him extensive learning of digitization which has helped transform the power sector. He has held leadership positions in management, operation, sales, strategy, and business development with global responsibilities based out of Europe and India. With his vision and execution, he has ensured Schneider Electric is an integral part of the journey to make New India energy positive. Under his stewardship, Schneider Electric business in India underwent a transformation through the creation of a sales force working across business units, focused on customer satisfaction and cross selling enabling the organization to track close to 2x growth during its tenure. He champions the cause of energy efficient and green technology with a focus on infrastructure development, climate change, access to energy, and skill development. Over the last six years, and its most energy intensive facilities, Snyder Electric India has reduced energy costs by 40% and 30% of total energy use comes from the renewable sources. His passion for energy efficiency is also reflected in the multiple papers he has published on the application of digital technology, automation, and IoT for energy management and efficiency of the smart infrastructure and smart cities. An avid advocate of promoting diversity and inclusion, he's also a member of Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Board and Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric, India's efforts to in this space was acknowledged by the Catalyst Award 2019 for his significant contribution towards strengthening Indo-French economic relationships. He was conferred with the highest French civilian distinction, Knight of the Nation of the Honor, in 2016. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to present Horace's KPMG India Business Leader of the Year Award for Business Transformation to Mr. Anil Chaudhary, 
managing director and president Schneider and Dr. Sandra. Business transformation is a continuous process and one that determines the relevance of our business in the ever-changing uh, global corporate ecosystem. Mr. D. Shivakumar has placed this art at the Aditya Birla Group. As the group executive president of Aditya Birla Group, he is responsible for strategy and business development. Given his more than two decades of experience in sales, marketing, and management positions across the consumer products and luxury industry, he was elected as the chairman of the Advertising Standards Council of India. He is the former chairman and CEO of PepsiCo India for four years, and earlier associated with Nokia as the CEO for India, and later emerging market for nearly a decade. He worked in Hindustan Unilever for several years, primarily in marketing. He's been a CEO for half his career and was one of the youngest CEOs in India. He has worked with more than 50 brands in his career and has been responsible for various business transformations. His focus on enhancing consumer engagement has led to the launch of many successful innovations across product categories. He is an avid writer and is also involved in teaching innovation, leadership, business models, digitization across the leading business schools in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to present the Urasis KPMG Indian Business, business Leader of the Year Award for Business Transformation to Mr. T. Shivakumar, Group Executive President, Corporate Strategy and Business Development at the Tibur Lago. Last but not the least, recognizing excellence in the field of corporate citizenship, of which our awardee is Roshni Nader Malotra is a true inspiration. Heading a $8.6 billion global enterprise, as a CEO and executive director, she has been responsible for providing strategic guidance to the organization. She is also a vice chairperson and on the board of HCL Technologies and chairperson of its CFR committee. As a trustee of Shiv Nader Foundation, she is focused on the process of nation building by driving transformational leadership through education. She is also the chairperson of Vidya Gyan, a leading academy which focuses on nurturing future leaders from the meritorious but economically underprivileged rural students. I believe that children born without a silver spoon should be given equal opportunity has been driving force behind the success of Vidya Gyan. Her passion for wildlife and nature led to the foundation of the Heritage Trust, which she is working towards creating and conserving sustainable ecosystems and their ingenious species through strategic partnership and collaboration with all stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to present the Horizons of KPMG India. Business Leader of the Year Award for Corporate Citizenship to Ms. Roshni Nader Malotra, Vice Chair of Personality Technology and Trustee Shiv Nader Foundation. Since Roshni could not make it in person, as we have to cancel the program at the last moment, may I request Mr. Sundar Mahalingam to receive the award on our behalf.
for a small panel discussion, if I may invite Mrs. Virla, Mr. Sharma, Mr. Chaudhary, and Mr. Sip Kumar on their stage, please. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let me start uh, with you, Mrs. Virla. Indian corporate uh, has always been doing CSR activities for ages. Your own group is well known for charitable and philanthropy work, which has been done over the years. 2013, company that came up with the mandatory CSR. How do you see the change in last few years? How CSR has evolved uh, over this period? Has come along with it. Even before CSR became a word in the business landscape, our family, starting from Mr. G.D. Bilal, has always been deeply involved in welfare driven activities. And my grandfather in law was very close to Gandhi. He was uh, his follower and ardent supporter. So naturally, we got this philosophy of um, the philosophy and the thing of um, frustration, which is a really uh, influential. And basically, there is a paradigm shift in the very approach to see it. Business houses run businesses with a much larger purpose, not just to grow and profit and revenue but also support society. And that way they get a good respect and good will also. CSR is a critical element that just simply impacts the business. I believe at the corporate level, CSR is a major source of differentiation and positive advantage. Embedding social societal concerns in a company's priority is absolutely, absolutely integral. Brand building. Business is not simply an end itself, and it has to result also in the larger good of society. Thank you. If I may ask the next question to you, uh, we talk about the demographic dividend uh, that India must uh, take advantage of, uh, and leveraging the uh, startup ecosystem. Is, is seen as quite uh, important to achieve that uh, How do you think the, uh, you know, you being a successful entrepreneur yourself, how do you think the, uh, the startup ecosystem has evolved in India? And is it moving towards uh, a situation where the demographic dividend uh, is something that we can expect using and leveraging the startup space? Uh, yeah. Yeah. First of all, thank you for us, this opportunity for giving such a beautiful award. Thank you so much. Um, I totally believe that the big reason for India's success uh, in technology startups or otherwise startups that we will see will be based on the very fact that we have this demographic advantage. Uh, if you think traditionally, it means that means significantly hard working. They have persuaded the hard work like complex management. Here we have shared to any years that we see in the world. So, the complexity of the business environment is easy for the Indians as a part of our DNA, I would believe, to handle. They are used to a finally unknown far better than many other uh, communities in the world. Now, uh, startup stands for that you're building something zero to one. So, there is a uh, heavy uplifting of uh, your resource energies and then there is an obligation of market to exist. India has always been a market available but constrained by the risk capital. So uh, once that we saw this risk capital to come happening from Asian very different countries, we've seen this uh, success of startup ecosystem to so to say. Uh, if you notice uh, 2000 to 2010, era was not so very fancy, even though technology was equally uh, challenging or new in the world, purely because the capital was not there of that time. So with, we saw the early seeds, and then now, while I would say that India is well capturing its market, 
it's, it's leading by example of addressing uh, market needs by local entrepreneurs. So I am a fundamentally believer that change agents of this country will be young people who will or who would be addressing younger audience. Uh, it, it's clear in the world that new or younger person is ready to accept and try out new things versus uh, older person is more or less uh, tough to challenge or change the status quo that they're coming from. And that's very well understood why they do that. So I think India is a market for trial and experience experiments. You must have seen that many Western technology companies also see India as a huge and larger market than even other countries. So um, it's, it's a great and uh, probably the biggest uh, starter point of our strategy system. Uh, and I if I may ask you, uh, you know, when we look at India, it's, it's a global economic powerhouse in the making. And for any transformation, uh, energy is the heart. How is technology transforming the Indian uh, energy sector? And what influences uh, would these changes have on the global lens? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you for SS KPMG for this uh, wonderful declaration. I've said that. Now, coming to the, you know, this whole question of energy efficiency. I mean, if you look from the point of view of that today, I will say the cleanest and uh, cost effective and sustainable source of energy actually is energy efficiency. Because whatever we are producing today, by the half we is consumed, almost 40 to 50 percent is not being consumed the way it is consumed. It's lost in various ways. And this is where the technology is playing can is playing and can play even a bigger role in food. And as we see that more and more power consumption and generation is going to be decentralized and it is going to be you know greatest uh, evaluation of uh, consumer serving consumer because while we will be using all those renewable power We'll also be able to put back on the grid, on the network, where we can use it. And digitization plays a big importance. And today, the smart grid, smart meeting, uh, smart distribution management system, which are making the whole ecosystem of energy usage visible. And once it becomes visible, once it becomes transparent, you have the tendency to make it more efficient, to use it more efficiently, as you know it, what you are using and what you are probably not using and how to make it happen. And it. I think going forward, when we look at India, I think we are at a point when we are building our infrastructure, as we saying that probably 80% of the infrastructure of India is still to be built. We can take the advantage of the latest technologies being available, adopt that rightly in our networks and systems of energy, and then leapfrog on that in terms of the way we can probably make and mix the renewable as it was with the vision which uh, Prime Minister Modi has said. If we have that renewable in our grid, probably India will be the country which will be the top most uh, in terms of the mix of conventional and renewable energy. And it could be a very much you know, impactful on the global uh, point of view of the commitment of carbon efficient use of energy and making sure that that renewable is becoming more and more sustainable and more and more consumers are able to contribute to the whole efficiency. So I see a big advantage, opportunity, and big push to the global, you know, energy uh, cycle as well, while India is on its journey of making energy efficient. So let me ask you, Mr. Kumar, uh, you have a very good view of what's happening in the corporate sector. Uh, and we have talked of technology in every facet of, of our lives today. Uh, and the space of change is faster. Uh, how are you looking at the Indian businesses in general, and how well do you think they are leveraging the change in technology? Thank you for that. Uh, that's a question which I think almost every forum we discuss and uh, chat about. Uh, I think when you, whenever you embark on a journey called digitization or whatever you want to embark on, you always want inspiration, companies who've done it. And the best example I can give you and the audience is, think of the IRPTC, the railway system. They handle 2 million tickets a day. It's the largest system in the world. 
if railways can do it, any company can do it. And many times, companies do not recognize that they need to start. That's all I would say, number one. Number two, I would say is that there are three parts to the digitization. The first is the raw materials and what you get into your plant. That's the first part of digitization. The second part is the making of the product or the service. And the third part is the way you attack consumer or go to market. So if you go back to the raw material side of it, thanks to MRO organizations, which is maintenance and repair and operations organizations, today they're willing to come and tell you we can give you a 5 to 10% saving on all your raw materials. Okay? We can compress the cost by so much. That's a hell of a lot of money for any person. Next. In the center is sensors and dashboards and the war room, which scans everything. This is a good, efficient mechanism. The third part is the customer part. Traditionally, all businesses have gone to the customer through a middleman, through a distributor, through some chain or the other. Every middleman who has added no value has been eliminated. Go back to the books industry. Bookshops are dead because the middleman added no value. Go to the travel industry. The travel agent is dead because he added no value. Go to the music industry. The music seller is dead because he added no value. So the lesson for all of us is, in that business model called digital business model, your middleman has to add value. If the middleman does not add value, then it doesn't work. And my personal lesson from digitization, number one, it must be led by the leadership. Number one. Number two, do not outsource everything. It doesn't work. Develop capability within the organization. Take chunks of the company and digitize. You cannot do the whole thing at one go. Next, have patience as you do. Okay, I think these are the lessons that I have learned as we have digitized the corporation that I have. Uh, Vijay, if, if I may ask you, if you look at India, uh, India is becoming a hub of startups. Uh, if I'm not wrong, outside the U.S., uh, India is the second biggest country to have a startup. But not all startups need the uh, COVID with unicorn uh, status. Everybody wants to know the mantra of how to be the unicorn. <laughs> I wish it was so. <laughs> or it was so, in a way, that there was a mantra, so to speak. I think uh, we just learned very clearly there's a market that you address and market opportunity and attraction of that could be your value. So there's no other macro map than the state map. Uh, remember, you can change the market definition by your your perspective and your outcome. And I'll give you a little bit of example and I'll give a very uh, common to all of us and led to payments. Typically, you can remember the machines, the card machines that you see on the shop. These companies used to be very undervalued because there was no value they were adding but of a terminal because the customer who is paying has a card of a bank and this money is going in a bank. So, I mean, the risk is just a pure terminal. So, they used to be fractionally valued when their revenue would grow well. But lately, what I've got discovered is that some magic person in India and China thought that I will have these SMEs, these businesses, as my customers who have got acquired for payments and I will now offer other financial services. So, I can offer them loans, I can offer them insurance, and blah, 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 blah. So now, one business model was looking at that as an end of business movement, versus now in the second business model, this is the beginning of the movement. So out of the blue, these all companies, which used to be trading at 8 or $10 billion, the largest of them, are now value 20 and $40 billion. So it is all about perspective that you bring in your offering to the customer, where, what kind of value you capture, what size of the value you capture. Um, a startup or a unicorn or a old mature company, the rule remains the same. You have to address a large market. Your offering should capture a significant amount of value. And then you're addressing large number of customers to the value makes you valuable. And this is the rule in the cost industry that is fixed. So, home, sleep, and rest, and rest, and rest. I'm going to come back to the Indian government, of course. Uh, you know, talking a lot about infrastructure, but I think one of the key changes uh, that one also now looks at is smart infrastructure um, and not just infrastructure. Uh, now, how do you expect the current focus on smart infrastructure play out, and how will this be different from you know infrastructure as we sort of traditionally look at? 
I think it's a, it's a very economic proposition to make infrastructure and smart infrastructure. If we go back 25 years, 30 years, there were a lot of studies where it was said that if you spend one dollar in creating energy and infrastructure, and energy being one of the four that uh, you made in infrastructure growth, you get an economy of something like ten dollar around that. But with the smart infrastructure, that equation has changed. Now, with one dollar spent on smart infrastructure, you create an economic cycle of twenty dollars, so it's almost double. That itself is a very economic situation for us now to go on and instead of creating more infrastructure and create smart infrastructure, because the economic value of that is very much uh, you know favorable for spending that little bit extra money that you require to make infrastructure and create smart infrastructure. But I'd say that if you look at all the big projects of government and smart cities is one of those. In, in fact, in certain ways, India is leapfrogging. Because many of the green field projects, which are now cities, uh, like Nairaipur uh, uh, in Chhattisgarh, is one of the examples, uh, which is uh, one of the first green field smart cities in India, with uh, power, with water, with transportation, with security, with buildings, and all connected, interconnected. And when this started five years ago, nobody believed that India can do that. But inaugurated by Prime Minister on June um, 2018. Now we get many visitors in that city coming from Middle East and uh, many other countries which are trying to make their infrastructure smart and how it can enable the whole world. This is an upcoming city, probably it's an example of Chandigarh 40 years ago. But I'm sure that what Chandigarh took 40 years, this could be probably doing in 10, 15 years. Because that's what I'm so it becomes very imperative today that any infrastructure which we are creating first being smart is economic scale. It's all about energy efficiency. It's all about connecting. It's all about digitization. It's all about very connected and digitized, uh, you know, citizens, uh, people living in those cities, people using those things, which makes it much more, you know, uh, uh, efficient and much more livable and much more easier. Yeah. So I say that future of India is that we are still to build our 80% infrastructure, as we say, as far as becoming a really a world economy. And the future of that is building everything which is smart, which means everything which is connected, and which is uh, building everything which has a technological and human connected together. And that will be the future. So, uh, this is like coming back to the, uh, the CSR part of it. Uh, if you look at India, uh, whatever we do in India is still falling short of what is required in the country. I mean, there are, whether we pick up uh, education, we pick up healthcare, we pick up old age, uh, you, you, uh, you can pick up innumerable uh, causes for which a uh, huge amount of work is required in India. Uh, as, as you have been engaged in this for a very, very, very long time, what would you suggest the corporate world uh, should do with more? Uh, what else can the corporate world do in this area? Corporate can really play a vital role in enhancing the human capital. India's young demography is an advantage which can be a good driver of growth and prosperity. Only they need some training and education. Corporates are like a beautiful place to enable this process given that. Given that factory of soft flow is where most products still and rapid learning happen. So there is an element of enlightening self interest for the corporate to invest in skilling, training, and apprenticeship, which has their own operation, as well as contribute to the society repository of human capital. And the other avenue for corporate to expand their scope of activities. It's through the with universities, 
to do more innovation and help find solutions to problems of industry and society. A related issue of democracy is the proportion of women in the workforce. India's labor force participation rate for females is the lowest, only 27% among its peers. And corporates can push harder to ensure that women are recruited in larger numbers at all levels, in space quality, and equal treatment. This will not only impact national infirmary in this country, but will also create a more equitable society. And finally, the biggest contribution business can make to society is by reorienting itself to the cause of sustainability. In many ways, CSR and sustainability are undeniably linked. Let me give you a few examples of companies. The company should take concrete steps to stem the water crisis that is critical. And water today is the scarce resource and well needed to walk the extra mile to conserve water and leave the planet in a better condition for future generations. Furthermore, companies should commit to increasing the contribution of green energy in the business. Our group company, Alphatech, has taken a bold step towards ensuring that 25% of its total energy consumption uh, will be green by 2021. And novelists has done the same. It, uh, it recycles 50% of its production. So on the positive side, I see that more and more corporates are sensitive to the new paradigm, and we have a long road ahead, and in many ways, the journey has just begun. Thank you. So coming back to you, Mr. Uh, talking about uh, geopolitics, and all the disruptions that one has seen around trade wars, and all kinds of uncertainties which impact both businesses of the company. Uh, how do you see Indian companies trying to deal with these challenges of geopolitics and, uh, and, and focus on growth at the same time? Are these strategies being influenced and uh, in how they deal with it? Yeah. So, the first thing I think is uh, India has produced a lot in 50 years or 70 years. And many times I don't think we celebrate that enough. As either corporate citizens or as society citizens. We are always complaining and worrying about why India is not doing okay, So that's the first thing. Today we are a little shy of a $3 trillion investment. Here's the interesting part the first trillion took 61 years to make. 61 years we went to the first trillion. The next two trillion are going to take just 15 years. So that's a dramatic change compared to what we have been used to. Okay, the Hindu rate of growth, etc. Now, the catch with India is whatever the GDP number, anything you do in India on a per capita basis will, be, will look bad. So, let's see. We are a 3 trillion economy with maybe $2,000 per capita. Even if we become a 10 trillion economy, we will be $6,000 per capita. We still will not change that. And I think that is something we must accept that on a per capita basis, India will have these numbers. But the sheer size of India is attractive to anybody. So if you look at the Indian uh, GDP, it's, it's a top six economy in the world. So does the world need India? Almost 30 years. Does India need the world? Almost 30 years. So I think I would advocate that we need what I call a dependent growth model and not an independent growth model. And we have to belong to the trade blocks. We have to make the concessions. We have to get concessions back. Okay, both are important. Uh, the Aditya Billa group this year hopefully will be upwards of between 45 to 50 billion dollar business. Okay, one of the largest businesses, uh, top 200 global fortune company. Half of business is India, half of business is outside of India. We have close to 150 plus factories across the world. So we are truly global in nature, and in some markets you see up, in some markets you see down. But that's the advantage of managing a portfolio of businesses as well as geography. So there is no one answer in that sense that I would say. But on the positive side, on the challenges of India, all of us know that agriculture is a challenge. Moving people out of agriculture into other jobs. 
infrastructure is a challenge. Jobs is a challenge. There's no doubt about it. But I don't think there is any silver bullet to address it. And my submission to you will be, even for the next 20 years, India will be what I call WIP, work in progress. And all of us need to commit to that work in progress. I don't think we can ever say that India has closed this chapter. No. I think we are a work in progress country and we'll continue. And that work in progress has enormous strength. We have one of the youngest populations in the world. We have a huge dig digital ecosystem in the world. Our soft power is fantastic. We have to believe in those strengths. Our savings rate is 30 plus, which is damn good. So these are the strengths which we take us forward. So I would say India should forget that we are an emerging economy. I would rather say we are a blossoming economy. If you are a top six, you cannot be an emerging economy anymore. You are a blossoming economy. We haven't reached the emerge status because on a per capita basis, we will never reach that status, even when we get to $10 trillion. That would be my submission in the way I would look at the economy. A dependent growth model, not an independent growth model, huge domestic market, and less capitalization. Thank you so much. I'm just conscious of time. I would love to continue to talk uh, with all of you for hours and hours, uh, but I'm constrained by the time. Thank you so much for being on the panel, and thank you so much for accepting this award. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Round of applause for